This tutorial is all about reversible reactions. Reversible reactions are ones which go forward and backwards and normally reach what's called an equilibrium, which is a balance between um, the reactants and the products, where there's a mixture of reactants and products left at the end. We're also going to look at what we can change in terms of the conditions of the reactions in order to change the percentage yield, which is essentially the amount of all of the substances which are products. First we must have an understanding of what's meant by a reversible reaction and what's meant by equilibrium and then to understand how we can uh, reach equilibrium from the very beginning of a chemical reaction. An example of a reversible reaction that we've met earlier in the course is the manufacture of ammonia in the Haber process. Now in the Haber process nitrogen and hydrogen react together to make ammonia, two molecules of ammonia. But the ammonia can also break down or decompose to make nitrogen and hydrogen again. So in this reaction the uh, reaction reaches what's called equilibrium and at equilibrium uh, two things happen. First of all the forward reaction and the reverse reaction happen at the same rate and secondly the concentrations of the reactants and the products remain constant and don't change anymore. You need to learn these facts that at equilibrium the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the backward reaction and that the concentrations of the reactants and the products don't change. When equilibrium's at the right hand side then the concentration of the products will be greater than the reactants but when it's at the left hand side the concentrations of the reactants is greater than the concentration of the products. Now if we're using this as a, an industrial process for example like in the manufacture of ammonia then we want to make sure that equilibrium is sufficiently to the right hand side because uh, that means that we can make the ammonia as efficiently as possible. When we first add two chemicals together, be it the nitrogen and the hydrogen or whatever, we start off with a forward reaction which starts off very, very fast because we've got our reactants in their highest possible concentration. As those reactants get used up, the rate of the forward reaction will then start to drop because the concentration of the reactants is dropping. However, as soon as we've got some of the nitrogen and the hydrogen reacting to make ammonia, we've also got some ammonia, and the ammonia will then start to react uh, and will start to decompose to make nitrogen and hydrogen again. So the reverse process starts off at zero rate, but as the amounts of the, of the ammonia increase, so the reverse process, the rate will also increase. Eventually, the forward process producing ammonia and the backward process breaking up the ammonia will meet in the middle and will have an equal rate for each. At this point here we've attained equilibrium. Here's an eta version then as the reaction proceeds the forward process slows down and the reverse process speeds up until both of them reach the same rate. At this point here we've reached equilibrium. That doesn't mean that the reactions have stopped the forward reaction is still going on, the backward reaction is still going on, but the rates of them are entirely the same as each other, so we don't get any change in the concentration of the products and reactants. You need to know that the position of the equilibrium, which gives you the percentage yield, might be affected by the concentration of any reactant or product, or the temperature or the pressure, and you may be able to interpret that kind of information from tables or graphs in exam questions. Here's an example of a reversible reaction. If we start off with some potassium uh, dichromate, potassium dichromate is an orange colour, but if we add water to that, it turns into a yellow coloured solution of potassium chromate. Now, if we want to change the potassium chromate back to potassium dichromate, we can add acid in the form of H+. Because if we add something to the right hand side of the uh, reaction it will force equilibrium to go to the left to use it up and if we add something to the left hand side of the equation it will force equilibrium to go to the right in order to use it up. You've got to understand this principle for higher level questions. For example removing a product moves the position of equilibrium to the uh, right 
but adding extra reactant does the same thing. Increasing the temperature, the effect that will have depends on whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic in any particular direction, and increasing the pressure can have an effect on reactions where there are gases involved. Looking at that same reaction as we looked at a moment ago, the dichromate on the left, the chromate on the right, we said that if we added water onto the left hand side, in other words if we added a reactant, equilibrium would go to the right. If we added a product, H+, equilibrium would go to the left. Now what about if we added sodium hydroxide to this mixture, you see what that would do was it would remove a product because the sodium hydroxide would react with the hydrogen ions. That would lower the concentration of the hydrogen ions. In this case, equilibrium would shift to the right in order to create more. And so removing a product shifts equilibrium to the right to try to replace it. If instead we add a product by adding more hydrochloric acid, more H plus ions, this will shift equilibrium to the left towards the reactants in order to try to use up that extra H plus. And so you would get less product and you get more reactants in the mixture. The theory behind this isn't actually on the GCSE specification, it's on the A-level one, but it's uh, Le Chatelier's principle. And what he said is that if a chemical system at equilibrium experiences a change in concentration, temperature, volume or pressure, then the equilibrium will shift in order to counteract that imposed change. And this only happens in reversible systems where we've got a closed system, in other words, that none of the reactants or products are allowed to escape. Let's have a look at this in relation to a reaction that we're familiar with, the uh, reaction to make ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen, or the Haber process. What happens if we change the concentration of a reactant or a product? Well, let's say we increase the concentration of a reactant. For example, we add more nitrogen into the mixture. Well, the equilibrium will then shift to the right. It will do this in order to use up some of the nitrogen, but in doing so, Shifting equilibrium to the right, it will increase the yield of ammonia. The reverse of this would be if we were to increase the concentration of a product. So let's increase the concentration of ammonia. What the equilibrium will do will shift to the left because it will wish to use up that extra ammonia. If the equilibrium shifts to the left, then the yield of ammonia will drop. Next, what happens if we change the pressure? Let's say we increase the pressure on this mixture. Well, let's count up how many moles of gas we have on the left-hand side. We've got one mole here, and we've got three moles here, equals four moles on the left-hand side of gas. But on the right-hand side, we've only got two moles of gas. If we increase the pressure, then the equilibrium will shift in a way as to reduce that imposed change, in other words, to reduce the pressure. So if the um, ammonia is made from the nitrogen and hydrogen, it will take up less space. Increasing the pressure will shift equilibrium to the right because that is the way that will relieve the imposed pressure. And what about a change in temperature? Well, in this reaction, we'd have to be told that the forward reaction is exothermic and that means that the reverse reaction is endothermic. Now if we increase the temperature then what the equilibrium will wish to do is to use up that additional heat and the only way it can use up that additional heat is to go in the endothermic direction because an endothermic reaction requires heat. So raising the temperature of this reaction will in fact favour the reverse reaction and we'll get a lower yield of ammonia. Finally, what's the effect on yield of adding a catalyst? Well, a catalyst speeds up a reaction. So it will speed up the forward reaction, but it will speed up the reverse reaction equally. And therefore, although equilibrium is reached more quickly, there's no change in the position of equilibrium. Because remember, at equilibrium, 
the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction is the same. And reminding us of these rules, here's a past exam question. This is about equilibrium and reversible reactions. Ethene reacts with steam in a reversible reaction to make ethanol. This reversible reaction can reach equilibrium if it's in a sealed container. At equilibrium, there's a connection between the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the backward reaction. What's this connection? Uh, rate of forward reaction equals the rate of the backward reaction and what happens to the concentration of ethene and of water at equilibrium it remains constant or it doesn't change second part of the question look at the table it shows how the percentage of ethene at equilibrium changes as the temperature changes and as the pressure changes. What happens to the percentage of ethene as the pressure increases but the temperature stays the same? In this case we must look down one particular column, it doesn't matter which one, let's look down this column. As we uh, increase the pressure, go from 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 atmospheres but keep the temperature still at 260, then the percentage increases. So what happens to the percentage of ethene? It increases. Calculate the maximum mass of ethanol that can be made from 5.6 tonnes of ethene. Well, this has suddenly turned into a moles question, but no worries. Well, one molecule of this is going to give me one molecule of this. So one mole is going to give me one mole. Okay, so let's work out what one mole of each weighs. Uh, for ethene, the MR for ethene, when it's got two carbons, which is 24, and it's got four hydrogen, which is four, which is 28. So one mole is going to be uh, 28 grams. Whereas for the ethanol, C2H5OH, that's going to be, well, two carbons is 24. Uh, it's got six hydrogens, that's plus six. And it's got one oxygen, which is 16, that comes to 46. So one mole is 46 grams. So if one mole gives one mole, then 28 grams is going to give 46 grams. I've got the answer of 5.6, so I can see a relationship there. Let's first of all double it. Let's say that 56 grams would give me double that, which is 92 grams. So 5.6 grams would have given me 9.2 grams. So scaling up, that means that 5.6 tonnes would give me 9.2 tonnes. So I've done it not using moles particularly, just done it by proportion. Uh, but moles has uh, snuck its little head in. So the maximum mass of ethanol would be 9.2, and here I'm going to need the units, 9.2 tonnes. So as you can see on the answer scheme here for that particular question, they've used moles to begin with. One mole of ethene makes one mole of ethanol, like I suggested, but then they've seen the relationship between the number 28 and the number 5.6, and they've scaled up just as I did.